Caroline Rooney, Professor of African and Middle Eastern Studies at the University of Kent. Professor Rooney studied as an undergraduate at the University of Cape Town before embarking on doctoral research at Oxford University. She works and publishes mainly in the areas of post-colonial studies and Arab cultural studies, focusing on the cultural expression of liberation struggles and their aftermaths in Sub-Saharan Africa, North Africa, and the Middle East. Her previous books include African Literature, Animism and Politics, 2000, and Decolonizing Gender, Literature and the Poetics of the Real, 2007. In her new book, Creative Radicalism in the Middle East, Culture and the Arab Left After the Uprisings, 2020, Professor Rooney outlines the importance of aesthetic strategies and creative expression in the left's critique of authoritarian and, and Islamic extremist discourse. Drawing on a wide array of texts and sources from poems to photographs to theory, the book shows how a poetics of disappointment, despair, and distrust, alongside one of dignity and solidarity, reconfigured senses of the sacred and enabled the left to reclaim ethical and progressive, quote, radical, unquote, values. In this way, the book offers an original conceptual framework for differentiating so-called radicalization from the creative radicalism of the Arab avant-garde. Note that this research has been funded by AHRC and ESRC grant programs under the Global Uncertainty Scheme and the Partnership for Conflict, Crime, and Security Research. Professor Rooney, welcome. Thank you very much, Male, for that introduction. Um, and my thanks also to Dina and um, Aki for inviting me and for arranging the session. Um, I'm yeah, delighted to join you all and thank you for this opportunity. Um, so I aim to speak for about 45 minutes to present an overview um, of my research. Um, I don't have a PowerPoint at such, but I will try and show a couple of images along the way. Um, so this latest book of mine, Creative Radicalism in the Middle East, is um, as indicated my third monograph. And although this wasn't intended, I think it, of it as the completion of a trilogy. And since this work sort of builds on the groundwork of my previous two books, I'll just say a few words about this earlier work. So my first monograph, African Literature, Animism and Politics, is a study of how anti-colonial liberation struggles, mainly in Africa, are mobilized in tandem with spiritual and ethical philosophies that cannot just be subsumed within a Western Enlightenment philosophical framework. In fact, this Western idealist tradition informs post-structures theory and serves actually to foreclose the animus philosophies that I was interested in at stake. Um, and so I, I undertook this because post-structuralist theory was informing um, post-colonialism in ways that were not looking at philosophies outside of this tradition, which I thought needed to be taken into account. My second monograph, Decolonizing Gender, Literature and the Poetics of the Real, attends to how the liberation struggles in question um, uncover what may be termed a reality of the feminine in, in various ways. I'll say a little bit more about this in the session. Um, and um, they do so in bringing to the fore what I call the lateral or horizontal dimension of being that certain Western philosophies and ideologies tend to eclipse in deploying overarching temporal frameworks that tend to relegate the other to a position of backwardness. So decolonizing gender is also a critique of um, the textual idealism that was being advanced through theories of ideological performative, performativity, sorry. Um, and instead it draws attention to what I call a poetics of the real. Um, well, I published Decolonizing Gender in 2007 at a time when the consensus was that the age of revolutions was over in Foucault's phrase. So it felt strange to be arguing for the ongoing insurgency of revolutionary struggles at that time. However, I'd already begun to connect with the Palestinian struggle through work I'd done in the anti-apartheid context. And I then actually began a study of contemporary Egyptian literature and popular culture, very much influenced by my PhD students who had actually come to work with me on liberation theory, but from the Middle East. 
and that that's what got me in, involved in this area. I owe a lot to them. And so I began studying contemporary, contemporary Egyptian literature and popular culture in the context of the war on terror, particularly that was the backdrop. And what struck me at the time was that the dominant discourse of area studies that I encountered assumed a dualist political configuration of authoritarian regimes on the one hand pitted against Islamic extremism on the other hand. And this didn't reflect the reality that I was encountering on the ground in, in, in visiting Cairo, Beirut, Jerusalem, and, and so on. And um, I felt that it was completely ignoring what I would call the Arab left comprised of intellectuals, activists, youth culture, and popular culture that was already in evidence um, years before the advent of the Arab Spring. So one of the starting points of creative radicalism in the Middle East was therefore to differentiate creative radicalism from the so-called radicalization of extremism. Um, and it, I, this will probably seem obvious to many people, but because it wasn't part of a discourse um, as such, I felt it needed to be flagged up as such. Um, and it also seemed to me that what was problematic was this appropriation of the term radicalization um, which, because radicalism is always referred to the left and was being used in a, a different way. And my argument is that the ideological justifications of the war on terror, together with this discourse of radicalization, have strategically served to obscure the difference between radical left wing resistant movements and far right or extremist movements thereby serving to maintain the order of neoliberalism as that which offers security against the persistent threat of extremism, the question of um, other alternatives being discounted. And I think this is ongoing because um, while attention was given initially to the Egyptian and the Tunisian uprisings, the media have much underplayed the ongoing um, dimensions of the uh, African and Arab revolutionary movements. I mean, it's, it's it's striking really how it has tried to not represent what's been going on in Sudan and Algeria and Lebanon and so on. Um, uh, yeah, I mean, I've spoken to people who don't even know that these things are going on that much <laughs> is how they're um, sidelined. Um, well, in my book, I specifically refer to this ideological operation. Um, in terms of what I call doppelganger politics or the politics of doubling. I state that the duality under consideration differs from the binarism of Orientalism, so popularized by Said, in that it is not one of self and objectified other, but rather one of self and not self, where the not self is paradoxically posited as that which is definitively and elusively obscure unrecognizable, occult, sinister, irresolvably, and thus permanently threatening. I think the whole discourse of extremism actually relies on not being able to comprehend the terrorist phenomenon. So it remains this elusive, persistently threatening, obscure thing. Um, if we take the classic doppelganger formation of Jekyll and Hyde, where um, Jekyll stands for the bourgeois liberal subject, Hyde does not constitute another self as such, but merely a terrorizing and shadowy not self, serving to justify a constant state of paranoia. I'm gonna see if I can share my screen here. Um, so um, I, I'm wondering if you can see this, it's a still from a 1931, movie of um, Jekyll and Hyde. So they're the same person, but obviously very different with um, the respectable Jekyll and the monstrous Hyde. Um, but it was interesting looking through the images of Jekyll and Hyde because um, they rely on, a, a lot of them rely on really racist caricatures of the Hyde figure time and again, actually. it's. Um, but very striking how, how this is um, done. Okay, um, so um, now I'm going to try and get back to um, trying to actually sort of get out of the screen sharing. Okay. Um, <clears throat> 
so that we're not sort of dominated by that image. Um, okay, so um, so that's what I mean by this Jekyll and Hyde um, formation. And in my work, I trace the discursive origins of the war on terror to a collection of essays edited by Benjamin Netanyahu entitled Terrorism, How the West Can Win, um, that appeared in 1986, therefore some years before 9-11 and the, the whole setting up of the war on terror. Um, it was discursively prepared for beforehand. Um, Netanyahu and his neoconservative American colleagues argue that their mission is to defend what they call the spiritual values of Western democracies through defeating the forces of terrorism that are indiscriminately aligned with both left-wing and right-wing insurgent movements. In the book, they're treated as um, uh, equivalent. Um, for instance, although Islamism is anti-communist, Netanyahu and his supporters constantly lump it together with communism. Communism and Islamic radicalism constitute the same thing in this discussion. And in brief, the agenda of this campaign is to set up a neoliberal extremist double, whereby the anti-sociality of neoliberalism is disavowed and projected onto the extremist not self, who is never an, a proper other subject as such, just this shadowy not self. I argue that this ideological formation of doppelganger politics <clears throat> has its emblematic geopolitical formation in the gated community um, Dr. Jekyll in the novel maintains a kind of gated community separatist logic in that his desire is to house the Jekyll and Hyde sides of his being in what he calls two separate entities, whereby he seeks self-sufficiency with no responsibility for his despised other. He likens himself to a city of refuge, but the refuge or sanctuary is a privatized one as in the gated community. Uh, <clears throat> supposedly self-enclosed sanctuary of privilege. And in addition, what is at stake in this is the attempt to reconfigure the capitalist materialist formation of the gated community in terms of spiritual values. So the gated community is always this paradise, <laughs> um, disavowing its sort of material values. Um, and I, I, here I found the study of the double by Otto Rank, Freud's psychoanalytic colleague, um, an instructive one. Otto Rank demonstrates that the romantic figure of the double displaces an earlier form of doubling, whereas the earlier formation posits a mortal self that is accompanied by its immortal soul. In the later secular formation that emerges with romanticism, the self is seen to usurp the place of the soul so that what was the soul becomes merely the harbinger of death. Um, the self and the soul are made to change places. Um, so that as the self becomes the soul, what was the soul becomes merely a deathly other. Thus, political leaders like Netanyahu appeal to the West supposedly spiritual values that are to, to be defended from the death drive of extremists. Um, anyway, one of the things that I've been concerned with is the extent to which Islamism arises through being interpolated or hailed into this doppelganger structure entailing a kind of mimetic rivalry as each side attempts to usurp the other, as happens in the formation of the double. Um, if neoliberalism attempts to spiritualize itself through its fake paradises and so on um, of the gated community fractal, Islamism constitutes in many ways a kind of commodification of religion. Um, <clears throat> it's a structure I think of mirrored oppositionalism spiritualized neoliberalism on the one hand versus commodified religion on the other. And on both sides, the other is at once foreclosed and internalized um, out of this drive towards self-sufficient singularity. And looking at the work of Saeed Qutub, he describes Islam as a self-sufficient singularity, um, which is what you find in the kind of neoliberal market fundamentalist accounts of neoliberalism, it's a self-sufficient singularity. Um, and I think that the paradox of this doppelganger formation that it is that it ari arises out of a desire to universalize singularity, um, which is paradoxical because Jekyll wants to be a singular self, but out of that very will to singularity, he gives rise to the phantasmatic existence of Hyde. Um, well, in the context of Egypt, Maha al-Sayyid has traced how Islamism arose mimetically as a simulacrum 
of commodified American culture with Islamic banking, Islamic TV, Islamic fashions, Mecca Cola and so on. She has a very interesting essay on how this unfolded. And she considers how the Egyptian revolution constituted a radical overthrow of this mimetic um, structure where it could be said that Egyptians got their culture back, which I think was something that we could see with the Egyptian revolution. Um, and um, I think that, you know, what is at stake is an epistemic formation that does not rely on the singularizing foreclosure on the other, but is instead based on what I would call non-dualism and the affirmation of coexistence. So this is the kind of epistemic shift that I want to introduce. Um, in my book, I write that while capitalism serves to desacralize human lives, in its dispiriting ways, the uprisings are to retrieve a sense of the sacredly real for many. Furthermore, in the face of the irrationality of the singular logic that paradoxically produces self-contradictory duality, the uprisings imply in many respects on a philosophical level, the retrievals of non-duality. I speak of this non-duality, but it's extraordinarily difficult to um, explain non-duality. That's one of the difficulties I keep running into. But we can see how this non-duality manifests itself through how assertions made about the Egyptian revolution, for example, can be met with counter assertions that are equally true. For instance, you could say that the, the revolution was both foreseen and not foreseen, both concerned with the secular and concerned with the sacred, both national in scope and critical of the nation state, both political and not political. I mean, if you say something about the uprisings, you often find you can say the opposite as being equally true. And <clears throat> what interests me is that um, this non-dualism maintains a kind of ambiguity that resists a binary logic in ways that, you know, works of art do. Um, what works of art are able to, to accommodate contradictory readings or readings that seem contradictory. Um, the, the point is that they're often only apparently contradictory because you can actually find the underlying connection between things um, in a non-dualist perspective, which relies actually on an underlying holistic unity. So things that seem different because there is an underlying unity will turn out to be somehow connected or related. Um, okay, so I'll, I'll now offer um, an overview of the chapters of the book as they unfold. The first chapter concerns itself with a critique of Hannah Arendt's The Human Condition because a number of commentators on Arab Spring have drawn on Arendt's secular humanist framework to explain the uprisings. However, I think that this use of Arendt fails to register how her thought is shaped by the German idealist Enlightenment tradition of thought. And my argument is that the uprising served to turn Arendt's theoretical paradigm on its head, the way Marx speaks of turning Hegel on his head. While in my earlier work, I explore how Hegel's philosophy rests on the foreclosure of African animus philosophy and the brother-sister spirit of liberation, Arendt begins her account of the human condition with her own gesture of foreclosure. She maintains that what she calls the contemplative life is not of relevance to the human condition as the domain of human activity. The contemplative life, she says, pertains to the mysticism and the sacred, Arendt saying, be this the ancient truth of being or the Christian truth of the living God. Um, as I state in the book, regarding the world of historical existence, Arendt introduces a strange way of determining the value of, hu of the human condition. While on the mystical side, you could say that the concern is with the immortal soul and eternity for Arendt, it is temporal existence that concerns the immortal. She writes, by their capacity for the immortal deed, by their ability to leave non-perishable traces behind, men, their individual mortality notwithstanding, attain an immortality of their own and prove themselves to be of a divine nature. So Arendt thus makes the sacred and the secular change places in what could be termed a linguistification of the sacred. And I think that in, in a certain respect, this does um, reflect um, on German Christian humanism, the, the kind of divinization of man that runs um, through German philosophy from Hegel and 
Feuerbach through to Heidegger. It's a kind of religious humanism that underlies us. Um, Arendt sets up her model for worldly immortality through establishing an hierarchical division between the economic sphere and the political sphere, the former as inferior to the latter, entailing necessity rather than freedom, economic necessity as opposed to political freedom. And the lowest rung of labor for Arendt is manual labor because it achieves nothing lasting or durable. For instance, the work of farming, cooking, cleaning, taking care of the young, ill and elderly does not produce tangible or durable products and seems to conform, constitute a form of drudgery and having to be repeated time and again. The kind of work that Arendt devalues could I think alternatively be seen as the most crucial form of work in that it attends to keeping life going. I mean, the pandemic has also made me think about this, the, the work that keeps life going. But since Arendt has bracketed off the sacred, this means that life itself loses its sacred value and is paradoxically aligned with mortality. Um, whereas Arendt's notion of immortality is instead aligned with images of certain historical human greatness. Um, more important for Arendt than the work um, of the laboring animal, in her words, is the work of Homo Faber or the manufacturers, the issues and tangible products or commodities, what she terms the stable world of human artifice. Arendt ignores how commodities are not, in fact, that durable as they're constantly updated and replaced. You know, we're constantly trashing commodities. So how durable are they? Finally, Arendt considers that it is political actors who have the capacity to transcend the realm of economic necessity due to how they are said to make lasting or permanent impressions of themselves on human societies. So Arendt's yardstick is one of permanence and endurance, but she also works with the logic of appearance in that her political actors, she says, require a space of appearance. In capitalist terms, her objection is to faceless labor, where the political realm serves to confer visibility on human actors, as it were, retrieving their humanity in that way. Um, and Arendt further maintains that the value of political actors lies in the performativity of their speech acts. And one of the things I found was that in 1955, the British philosopher J.L. Austin launched his lectures on how to do things with words in America at Harvard and Berkeley. And um, it's very likely that Arendt attended these lectures because she was there at the time. And her whole theory of these performative speech acts, although she doesn't mention Austin, is very, very close to, to what he says about the performative. Um, but I think that the problem with this, politically speaking, is um, it, it becomes problematic to speak of the political in terms of performative speech acts, which are not based on facts um, or referring to reality in that sense, but rather they serve to literalize what they speak of. That's what the performative does. Um, and this is due to their power of authorization. Um, so there's a kind of bureaucratic authoritarianism at stake. Something becomes a, the, the case because an official is empowered to say so. I mean, for example, an example of the performative that Orson gives is the wedding ceremony. So if a pr priest pronounces someone man and wife, it's because he has the power, the authorization to do so. A person in the street can't just pronounce someone man and wife. So it, it, what's important is this power of authorization that the speech, speech act has. Um, and what does that mean for the political is the question. Um, anyway, I'll now go on to explain how um, I think Arendt's paradigm does not do justice to the Arab uprisings, because for a start, the Arab protesters did not seek the durability of their political actors. Um, rather, the objection was to how these political actors, you know, Mubarak, Gaddafi, Assad, and so on, were clinging on to power, concerned only with their political immortality and empty self-congratulatory performances was, you know, a common perception. As I state in my book with Arab revolutionaries, in a democracy, political leaders should be temporary, not seemingly or dynastically forever. Instead of this, capitalist neoliberal economies render workers disposable. The uprisings reverse this with the message, we demand the right to remove our leaders, especially when they act as if they and their gated community dynasties were immortal while treating the workforce as superfluous. 
So it's this kind of reversal of the logic and it's the leaders who then became dispensable, not the people. What accompanied this was that the social order was no longer subservient to the state leading to a reassertion of civil society. Egyptian demonstrator Ali Hassan Amin Rabea observes that under Mubarak, the Egyptian people forgot or were made to forget what society means. Going on to say, during the Egyptian revolution, we discovered an astonishing new reality. The protesters treated their revolution and one another with the highest degree of civility. So the divide and rule tactics of the state were replaced with an ethics of cooperation, reciprocity and social decency um, manifested on the level of civil society. A number of those who took part in the Egyptian revolution um, have observed that it cannot just be seen as a political protest in that um, it offered the experience of a kind of awakening, a transformation of consciousness. Um, the ideology of the authoritarian capitalist nation state was overturned so that people felt reconnected to each other as well as to reality again, as Egyptian writers Ala al Aswani and Mona Prince have observed, it was a profoundly rehumanizing experience for them. Um, and in my view, as the people refused the would-be self-immortalization of political actors, I would say, I would use the phrase that they got their souls back. I mean, and I'm drawing actually on testimonies. This is not just me. Um, so, you know, in, in contradistinction to a, a kind of idolatry of political leaders, it, it was the sacredness of ordinary lives that were being affirmed, that which I see Arentus rather bracketing off. Um, when in Cairo a couple of years after the revolution, I took a photograph of the street display of an antique cellar based in El Moez Street. Um, and I just want to briefly show this picture. So I hope you can see that. So this was the, the photograph um, outside an antique cellar shop. And I took it because of the two famous heads of state. And what I didn't realize at the time that I took the photograph is that um, the shop owner had placed uh, an advert, it looked to me like a 1950s advert um, for a pest control company called Sorco. And um, so you have this little cartoon character advertising his uh, pest control company with drop dead and there's a little rat dead at his feet. And what was sort of funny was placing this um, advert for pest control um, above these portraits because it was, the message was um, pest control for leaders who outstay their welcome. <laughs> um, it was, I think, a deliberately sort of humorous take on things. Um, so, um, Yeah, sorry, I'm just trying to find my... Okay, so... Um, yeah, um, so... Um, so I, while in the first chapter, I sort of consider the, how the Egyptian revolution in particular serves to turn the human condition on its head, um, restoring value to the people. Um, in the second chapter, I analyze how writers of conscience have mounted a critique of how authoritarian regimes resort to the theatricalization of politics in a kind of hollow self performativity and in terms of what Adorno calls the jargon of authenticity. I begin with Zimbabwean writer Chen Shirai Hove's analysis of post-colonial Zimbabwe, of stating, I believe that corruption begins with the corruption of language. If a senior politician uses vulgar language in public, that is the beginning of corruption. Once language degenerates into a vehicle for untruth, people are engulfed in a form of corruption. And this is very similar to Adorno's critique of the authoritarian corruption of language during the rise of fascism. Adorno is stating the theological addictions of these years have seeped into language, the sacred quality of the authentic's talk belongs to the cult of authenticity. 
prior to any consideration of particular content, this language molds thought. The authority of the absolute is overthrown by absolutized authority. Again, Adorno is pointing to this inversion within the secular sacred relation. And I go on to show how Asya Jabbar addresses similar concerns in her readings of post-colonial Algeria in her work, Algerian White. In this work, Jabbar draws attention to how politicians across the polit political spectrum employ a hypocritical language of authenticity, while at the very same time, Algeria's intellectuals and writers of conscience are assassinated for their speaking of truth to power. And she, she writes, above all, what can you say of those who continue to rule in the confusion of that hollow political theater of which she gives many examples. And she shows that in these situations, political thinkers linguistify the sacred using a spiritual language in a merely performative way. Hence her phrase, this hollow political theater. And what is at stake is in this is the co-opting of liberation struggles for political advantage. In fact, it's paradoxically tantamount to colonizing the liberation struggle in ways that are, are cultish or sectarian. Um, and I think this is something fairly widespread. I mean, I, I've noted in post-colonial Zimbabwe, there was a colonization of the liberation struggle that was um, allied with just a, um, those in power and their party and so forth. Um, Marie Baguti sees that Israeli self-determination operates in a similar manner where he accuses Zionism of affecting what he terms verbicide where Chenjerai Hove speaks of the corruption of language by self-serving politicians, Baguti uses the phrase, which is very similar, the pollution of language. Hove refers to the vulgarization of political discourse and also referring to the vulgarization of language, Baguti states, oversimplification has always been a factor in the failure of poetry and prose, indeed of any discourse. But when it is the dominant characteristic of the language of politicians, it ends in fanaticism and fundamentalism, coupled with invincible superiority and a sense of sanctity. Simplification might be as history teaches us a recipe for fascism. And Baguti adds, poetry remains one of the astonishing forms in our hands to resist this obscurantism. We, the poets of the world, he says, continue to write our poems to restore the respect of meaning and to give meaning to our existence. So against the jargon of authenticity, poets, be they intellectuals or grassroots figures, have this responsibility of retrieving meaningful communication. Um, <clears throat> yeah, so um, when the Egyptian revolution broke out, veteran Egyptian poet Raman al Abnudi wrote a poem characterizing the Arab Spring as specifically the renewal of language. He writes, it is impossible that lying can wear the mask of truth again. They, the youth, have written the first lines on the page of revolution. In the Syrian context, Lisa Widin has examined how the cult of Hafiz al-Assad drew on a fake aura of the sacred, its own jargon of authenticity. An artist, Saha Omarin, Syrian artist, drawing on Widin in a more contemporary context argues, it is no longer acceptable to make representations of concepts such as freedom, justice, and dignity using the same methods, language, and techniques that the Bashir al-Assad regime's propaganda employs. So th these terms are co-opted by, you know, uh, ruling segments of the society in hypocritical ways. And if we look at the work of performance artists and rap poets, which I've done a fair amount of, it's possible to see how they wrestle with retrieving a responsible and meaningful use of language. So for example, rapper Loki raps, they're calling me a terrorist, like they don't know who the terror is, insulting my intelligence, oh, how these people judge. And this is a long rap sequence about, um, what, what, how do you use the term terrorist? What is, are its meanings? So he's arguing for a meaningful um, use of the term. Um, or Rafif Siada in her performance poetry states, I wish for quiet from those who battle to get to the microphones and perform the rituals. I will not mourn my dead in 140 characters for your Twitter. Um, 
Egyptian activist Ala Abd al fatah wrote in 2017 that the defeat of the revolution was, quote, a defeat of meaning, which I found striking. Um, but he says that the struggle continues in that quote again, meaning has not yet been killed. So um, what is at stake here it, it is that many are, especially um, writers and intellectuals see it as this struggle for meaningful communication in the face of empty, empty performativity. Well, in my third chapter, I, I turned to Judith Butler's analysis of performative assemblies um, in that they, um, Butler using the plural pronoun, put forward in the context of the Arab uprisings. Um, so um, Judith Butler is one of those who apply Arendt's frameworks to the Arab Spring. And in doing so, um, Butler conceives of the revolutionaries as near mute bodies. Um, something that I find strange given how vocal and expressive the revolutionaries were, but she uses this terminology referring to the revolutionaries as bodies throughout. Um, and Butler's assumptions rest on the application of their performative gender ideology to the Arab Spring. The whole account of performative assemblies begins with reintroducing gender ideology. Um, and the basis of Butler's analysis can be traced back to their earlier reading of Antigone, where they read Antigone as representing the question of how queer and African-American identities are to be assimilated into the white American world of heteronormativity. And in that work, Butler's conclusion is as follows. And I've inserted the term, the Arab alongside her use of the term Antigone to make a point. So she writes Antigone or the Arab is not of the human, but speaks in its language. Antigone, or the Arab, speaks within the language of entitlement from which she is excluded, participating in the language of claim. If Antigone, or the Arab, is human, then the human has entered into catacresis. We no longer know its proper usage. I've said that because it, I find this passage really startling. You know, what does it mean to speak of African Americans or Arab revolutionaries as not of the human, but speaking in its language. Um, and I think that the, the assumption seems to be that language is owned by the patriarchal West, whereby queer and transgendered people followed by Arab protesters are obliged to claim this he hegemonic language for themselves. Um, co this constituting supposedly an abnormal appropriation of the norm that has no foundation in reality. Um, and I think that for Butler, everything is always prescripted. This is the, the question in a way that for me forecloses the creativity and spontaneity that are so much in evidence and revolutions. You know, outside of this performative rehearsal of what is always already scripted, what, of, what about what is creative and spontaneous? Um, and so with this, the others of the Western patriarchal subject are accorded a position of muteness. Um, whereas, you know, people like Chomsky say, we're all born with an innate capacity for language. Um, so, you know, what is at stake in this hegemonic ownership of authority that Butler's ideology speaks of wanting to claim? Um, um, so, yeah, Butler speaks of the revolutionaries as but bodies that lacking articulation resort to putting themselves on display for the media, she says, physically exhibiting their dejection and vulnerability, their precarity, um, exhibiting it as such through their bodies. Um, however, to me, this accords with the capitalist media gaze that constantly presents images of foreign others in terms of bodily distress, bodies ravaged by famine, wounded by war, afflicted with illness, humiliated by powerlessness, washed up dead or dying through des desperate bids to escape regions of conflict. Um, and so we see this biopolitics of neoliberalism exhibited and seldom hear the stories of these people in their own voices. What does it mean to occlude those voices? Um, because the irony is that, that um, the theorists come to speak for the revolutionaries. And I tried to quote as much in the book so that I would be uh, allowing a lot of voices to be heard. 
Um, so Butler asks, how does the unspeakable population speak and make its claims? I quote, she calls them the unspeakable population. And I just say, well, you could quote the revolutionaries, Erhal, leave, change freedom and social justice as one of the slogans, raise, raise your voices high, whoever chance will not die. I mean, you can just quote the revolutionaries. Um, okay, so, what I attempt to do in my book is to show that the uprisings, particularly in Tunisia and in Egypt, entailed a re rejection of the hegemonic Hegelian forms of interpel interpolation of hailing, where the revolutionaries proved capable of acknowledging hailing and welcoming each other. And I call this anarchic hailing because it doesn't depend on the mediation of authorities, but rather on the collective consciousness of the people beyond hierarchizing's sectarian identity politics. Here, speaking of how women used to view each other through the gender stereotypes of norms, revolutionary Amira Abdurrahman states, for the first time, we were not looking at each other in the old way. Our eyes met and we smiled at each other and we shared the victory sign. Businessman Hazem Mania states, and it was an amazing moment when I arrived in the square, people I'd never met before were hugging and welcoming me like a brother. I didn't know there were so many people who wanted the same thing. So they were recognizing each other immediately without mediation. Um, for Butler, the only alternative to hegemonic recognition and that kind of interpolation is the transgender form of auto interpolation or self-hailing. Um, However, I think that the self-conscious self-acknowledgement was not what was at stake in the Arab uprisings. Rather, you recognize the freedom of spirit in another as they recognize your freedom of spirit. Um, so it's not that you're, as it were, hailing yourself. You're, you are hailing the other and they are hailing you, but not through the authorities. And what this gives rise to is the collective affirmation of each other's individual freedom of spirit. So it is at once relies on collective dynamics, but it affirms the individual. Um, and the uprisings had a very spontaneous character that I think depends on this other consciousness where um, self-consciousness is often really what inhibits spontaneity. It's hard to be self-conscious and spontaneous. Spon there was this other consciousness that is, I think, related to spontaneity. Um, so, um, yeah, so I think that the, the experience of the uprisings did entail a kind of transformation of consciousness that was lib a, a liberation, um, particularly from biopolitics, um, as I say that uh, in terms of the revolutionaries getting their souls back as a kind of <clears throat> joyful regaining of dignity. Um, Allah Abed al fatah uses the same terminology in saying that someone asks him whether the revolution had failed. And he said, yes, in a certain sense, but it also succeeded. And he said, it succeeded in saving the soul of the people. He uses that terminology. Um, yeah, so... Um, and, and with this, people uh, attest to the, the, the revolution is feeling very real. Um, Omar Robert Hamilton, for example, speaks of how real it felt. Um, and I would add that the, the experience of the real pertains to this ethic of solidarity that has its own forms of signification. And revolutionary signification often draws on what I call Ostensive signs, ostensive signs being signs that don't create reality in the form of the performative, but point to a reality beyond them. Eamon Eldersuki speaks of this as Amara. <clears throat> in contradistinction to the jargon of authenticity, true Amara entails acting in good faith, where a member of the community, <clears throat> sorry, may put forward signs to aid the community to find its best way forward warning against the pitfalls of a given situation. Amara in its key orientation may be understood in terms of signifying practices mobilized for the common good, both indicating what this might be and designating paths towards it. And so I think that this kind of extensive signification constitutes a kind of precisely a sign language outside of official discourses. 
a sign language say of rallying cries, of warnings, notice boards, blogs, support networks, escape routes, and the like. This popular discourse of revolutionary sign language, often poetic rather than literal, can be found in the dominant expressions of the uprising, graffiti, rap music, <clears throat> popular a la Mia poetry, a cultural repertoire of songs, jokes, and slogans. As has been widely examined by Ella Mamsi and Solomon Tripp Baker Marys and, and many others, very usefully so. And far from being a display of bodily vulnerability and dejection, the revolution articulated in as many voices as possible the freedom of spirit that of the people that could offer the hope, at least, of safety and solidarity. In the book, I speak of this as what I call the Dawish avant-garde, Dawish in the Lebanese sense of the everyman, in a way, where the term avant-garde refers to a vanguard offering social support and social guidance. We've, I think, forgotten this word, this meaning of the avant-garde, of, of people who try and point ways forward um, for the community. <clears throat> So I argue that the problem with Butler's frame of analysis is that instead of seeing the transgendered as a minority worthy of respectful treatment within a much wider whole where everyone deserves respect, it's as if the transgendered come to signify the new norm um, that the majority need to adapt to. So it's this creation of a new norm that I would call into question. Um, particularly because the, this, Theory of gender ideology, there's so many problematic debates around it that you kind of almost don't want to go there. But it, what, what the revolutions brought to the fore, uh, as many said, was the, the, uh, um, the role of women in them, um, as has been affirmed by many scholars, including Dalia Mustafa Saha Amugi and, and others. Um, so again, I'll just try and put up um, an image of relevance here. Um, So here's the 2019 Lebanese revolution, women very much at the fore. Um, the Sudanese revolution, liberty is not a statue anymore. She is alive with fresh and blood. Adaf Suef addressing the crowds in Egypt. Um, and there, there's so many of these um, iconic um, images. Um, and there's been a lot of discourse about how women came to the fore. Um, but I'd add that this differs from Western feminism in that it infirms um, the comradeship between men and women um, in the mutuality of liberation struggles. So it's not about the individual advancement of women getting ahead, but it's much more about the contribution of women to society as a whole, how their contribution is necessary <clears throat> to the sort of regained holism of the society. Anyway, I think that the Arab uprisings were, were not about identity politics, con constituting a break with such. I mean, you could possibly say that Islamism is a form of identity politics in reaction to Western identity politics. But I think, of course, the Arab revolutionaries were concerned with social justice and the rebuilding of inclusive civil societies. Um, However, I think that you could say that the movements of Islamic extremism and the revolutionary left can be said to emerge out of the same socio-economic conditions, but they constitute very different responses and trajectories to those conditions. And chapters of my book go on to explore that. Um, so, you know, what is at stake is countering the authoritarian, sectarian and neoliberal conditions that produce chronic disappointment, precarity, humiliation, and so on. Um, but um, the extremist um, compensation tends to be one of a politics of pride, whereas the revolutionary one is one of dignity. And I'm concerned with trying to e explore the difference between a politics of pride and one of dignity. Um, and I do this not through ideology, because I, that... Um, tends to confuse things, but to, to, to look at psychological and emotional structures and their signifying practices, their, their practices of expression to explore how pride and dignity are not the same. Um, uh, there's the case that is, the Islamic 
Islamophobic group's approach to Islamic extremism ignores that various pride movements have much in common as psychological formations and structures of feeling, and also ignore how these movements express themselves through similar signifying practices. Um, so um, for this reason, I devote a chapter to juxtaposing Islamism in its Islamic state form with white pride, Hindu nationalist pride, and Zionist nationalist pride um, to show some of the, the, the things in common. And one thing that came to intrigue me is how pride movements emulate left-wing liberationist movements, but do so in a separatist and nostalgic manner. So for example, the far-right racist uh, white pride band Screwdriver appropriates the language of liberation struggle, saying, I stand and watch my country today. It's so easy to see it's been taken away. And they go on and, and configure themselves as the colonized and as the oppressed. But, so they draw on this whole kind of language and um, to, to say that we are the colonized victims, um, feeling belittled, belittled and marginalized and overlooked. Um, and here what's at stake is that um, the, the, the sense of pariahdom and victimhood is often reconfigured as a kind of elite position, um, the kind of irrationality of a kind of pariah elitism, which actually kind of funny is, is uh, uh, analyzed in a Palestinian context where he warns against the dangerhoods of victimhood as, as a badge of superiority that um, you're elite because of feelings of um, humiliation and um, victimization. So this is the, the kind of pride formation that I kind of look at um, that leads to a kind of um, identity fetishism in a way that we talk of say commodity fetishism. Um, secondly, what, what I look at is um, how these pride groups have similar signifying practices. Um, they often have a kind of sentimental and nostalgic approach to the loss of self-esteem, resulting in fantasies around lost ideals and the desire to literalize these ideals. And it often produces a kind of kitsch aesthetic, um, uh, you know, um, a kitsch use of an idealized, romanticized past of heroism, variously identified with, in Breivik's case, Viking cultures or pagan spiritualism, or often chivalric medievalism, um, crusader or jihadist, depending on the context. Um, and I think that this kitsch aesthetic starts to sort of replicate the kind of kitsch aesthetic of things like gated communities. Um, in other words, it's, it's a faking a kind of sincerity, which is this jargon of authenticity. Um, and I'd hasten to add that fakeness is pro isn't the problem. I have no problem with what is fake, but it's, it's positing the faked as the epitome of authenticity and sincerity and, and so on. That's what produces the Kitcheners. Um, yeah, um, so the sixth chapter of the book is on the poetics of Karama, or as I say, why the Egyptian revolution was a poem. I'm beginning to run out of time here. so. Um, it would be difficult to um, go into this, but what, what matters with the question of, is the, the question of Karama I see is bound up with the poetics of the, the real. Um, and I kind of discuss this in a great deal of technical detail around Jacobson's um, definition of the poetic function that he defines in terms of how synchronic and diachronic axes of language interrelate. But for Jacobson, the poetic is a language that draws attention to itself. It's linguistically self-referential. But I see in the, the kind of revolutionary context that this is not how the poetic is functioning because instead of the two axes being linguistic, they are existential. There's a, the temporal axis of deferral which is the diachronic for Jacobson. And the synchronic axis is an axis of the lateral dimension of side-by-side -side relationships where everyone can be together at once. And these two things um, interrelate. Um, and the important thing is to, to mention here is that 
it displaces the temporal dynamics of a usurpatory dynamics, uh, a capitalist dynamics of exchange and substitution <clears throat> and so on. It allows for the, the side by side to exist um, uh, where um, this poetics of substitution doesn't come, up, come in. It's rather that it affirms an accretive um, dynamics of collective consciousness that, that that everyone can stand side by side, that there is room for everyone. And this relates to the possibility of dignity. Um, Schroeder and Betty, Benny Sadia state that in Islam, human dignity increases as we honor each individual and encourage them to increase their own dignity. And I draw on um, a number of other figures who see that dignity is a matter of allowing for the space of the other. Um, and to do that, you also have a respectful distance from that other. You, you do not usurp them, you allow them their place. So a dignity revolution is about undoing coercive structures. And instead of being about taking, claiming and grasping power, it's about giving, receiving and acknowledging others, living generously, um, which Reem Abu al Fadl has discussed at length in terms of the as it were, manners of the square, how, how people respected and helped each other. Um, so it's allowing space for the other. Okay, so in, in the, the final two chapters, I take up different aspects of this question of the sacred, and I'll just rush over it very, very quickly. Um, so in, in, in one chapter, I treat of figuring the sacred in martyr art, because the, the question of martyrs, I think, has been huge for the revolutions. and. I look at Elias Khoury's white masks because he mounts, I think, a certain critique of martyr posters as a kind of glorification of martyrdom that he sees as being potentially manipulative, um, as um, whitewashing um, the whole breakdown of society through the, these glorious images. Um, so I do a reading of white masks in that way, but I also look at how different um, the, the martyr art of the um, Egyptian revolution was, and I can show an image if, if people would like to see later. Um, um, but uh, really um, what is, uh, emerges in the, the kind of martyr mural art was an attention to the sacredness of each of those lives that were lost. And instead of glorifying sacrifice, the message is these lives should not have been sacrificed. Um, and so finally, I have a rather strange last chapter, which is where I look at um, what I call equine messianism in Palestinian literature and um, film, because the, the, the figures of horses function in an interesting way as a kind of symbol of liberation struggles and I explore what that means because um, they, they, they function as in an iconic way these symbols rather than in an idolatrous way. Um, I, uh, yeah, um, I'm, I'm sorry, I don't really have much time to, to ex explain this, but um, yeah, um, looking at the time of white horses, um, the horses um, signify a certain freedom of spirit that actually also goes beyond the human. And I thought that was also important because um, some of these debates start to link up with um, the kind of animus and indigenous philosophies that I, I was interested in earlier. And I, I kind of think that if you're really going to overturn things, you probably have to also consider the, the ecological context of, of things. Um, so I'll just end actually with a quotation from Allah Abed al fattahs recently published prison writings. Um, he states, one thing I know is that the sense of possibility was real. It may have been naive to believe our dream could come true, but it was not foolish to believe that another world was possible. It really was. Um, and I, I remain haunted by that sense of what was possible and what we can um, remember as having learned from. You know, I'm, I'm very interested to, to know what other, thing, other people think might have been the lessons um, 
of those uprisings um, that I think that we, we need to stay with. But um, yeah, I'm keen to find out what others think. Thank you. Thank you very much, Caroline. I, um, yeah, people should write their questions in the chat. I see there's one. I'm, I'm going to ask um, another one first um, as chair. I just, I, I was hoping you could talk a little bit about, because I feel like you're trying to, to maybe we conceive things so that we no longer see the Islamic extremists on the one hand and the secular left on the other hand, but you you want to show how the people who we would have associated with the secular left are also engaged with, with notions of the sacred and with religion. And um, this phrase, the Darwish avant-garde that you use for me that, that evokes um, like kind of a, a Sufi vibe. Um, I, I wonder if you could talk a little bit about the, the, the kind of Islam that you see as, as feeding into these revolutionary activities and, and how would a dar Darwish avant-garde differ from a secular avant-garde? That's my question for you. Yeah, well, um, that's very important and it does get to the heart of what I'm trying to struggle with because in a way I was surprised when I was looking at a number of testimonies how much the the uh, expression of the revolution in terms of the sacred came up it's it's it surprised me but it also interested me because when I was working on uh, the Zimbabwean liberation struggle that was very much conceived in terms of the sacred and this kind of differs from how revolutions are looked at in a kind of Western context, certainly American and French revolutions. Um, and so I kind of have kind of wondered about how one articulates this sense um, of the sacred. And um, in a way, I think that um, the way I've tried to make sense of it is partly through Sufism, indeed, um, where I mean, a number of people said that when the Egyptian revolution broke out, it reminded them of a Sufi mulid. Um, so it was a festival sort of with that sense of celebrating the sacred, but the sacred um, therefore has to do with um, our ties to each other. So you, it could be accommodated within a secular framework. Um, it, you know, it, it doesn't necessarily have to be articulated, articulated in that way, except for the experience that the people said it felt sacred. It felt um, very powerful. Um, and I'm always fascinated to talk by those who were in, involved in the revolution. I know that when it broke out, I just felt an incredible happiness. You know, <laughs> every time I thought of the revolutionaries, I wanted to smile. Um, I, I didn't rush out there because I thought, no, this is this is their revolution. I, I'll keep my re respectful distance and watch, you know, with admiration and learn. But I, I did feel that extraordinary um, feeling of joy, actually, <laughs> um, that, that people spoke of. And then one way of interpreting that is to affirm the, the sacredness of these connections, um, of people feeling that they were connected again, um, that they weren't so dreadfully alienated and alone and, and so forth. Um, and I, I do think that if, if one wanted to sort of address it in a Sufi context, it's this case of um, that there is an underlying unity to our existence um, that makes things meaningful. Um, and um, I found this very much in the context of the Zimbabwean liberation struggle in that each person has value because of the other people. Um, so that's how you feel valued, but it's in, in connection to that collective, to that whole, which, you know, can have the sacred significance. And it's, it is this case of valuing these lives that just shouldn't be thrown away. Um, so it, you, you could just accord the sacredness to life itself, which is what, um, Elias Khoury does in White Mars. He says that he himself is not religious, but he understands the discourse of the sacred because he he believes in the sacredness of those lives that shouldn't just be thrown away um 
So it's not dogmatic as such, I think, um, but I am really struck by it being part of the discourse. Um, I don't know if others have anything to, to, to say about that, um, particularly those who might have been in, you know, in, in, actually in the revolutions at the time. Okay, we have a couple of questions. There's one from um, Noha Askar. Is the corruption of language evident in the Arab novel? Would you please extend on the topic of humiliation in the Arab novel? Thank you. Um, I'm not sure. Do you know what she's referring to with the corruption of language? Yeah, I think that, yeah. that, 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 that in the Arab novel, there is definitely a critique of this. I mean, um, Asya Jabbar's Algerian White is all about it. You know, from start to finish, she is talking about this question. But um, I, in, in the book, I look, I go back to um, Kanafani and Mafuz because they, they treat of these conditions of what I call chronic disappointment. Um, so um, yeah, in um, uh, the day the leader was killed, um, Mafuz looks at how young couples are unable to um, marry and have their lives on hold because they can't get proper jobs. Um, and they just want ordinary lives, but um, they are, are forced into situations um, of desperation and also of humiliation through their economic um, circumstances. Um, and um, there is a kind of critique of how um, political language is being used in a false way that fails to engage with the hopes um, of these people. And I think that, that someone who um, takes that up and does his own version of it is Ala Al Aswani in the Yakubian building, where, which is all about um, uh, a young person who gets radicalized because um, all, all their dream, dreams um, come to nothing. So they believe in the, in the, the, the discourse of the politicians around aspirations and things, but then they find that it's a hypocritical discourse and they can get nowhere with it. I'm not sure if this is answering your, your question, but um, I think that the Arab novel is, is um, very concerned um, with these questions. You know, from kind of funny Mufuz up, up to now. <laughs> yeah, we have another question um, from Justin. You mentioned that discontent with conditions of neoliberalism were a foundation in leading to the revolutionary movement in the Arab Spring. I am also interested in hearing your thoughts about neoliberalism in the post-revolutionary context, specifically in Tunisia and its relationship with the growth of civil society. Did you get that? Yeah. Yeah. Um, well, I, uh, yeah, I mean, it, it's, it's so tenacious that that's one of the things that um, makes me despair, actually. <laughs> um, and um, the, 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 the question, um, it's extremely difficult to find ways around um, the dominance um, of how neoliberalism is accepted. It's, it's accepted as, a, as if it is forever and we can't dislodge it. A bit like, you know, we're saying about rulers that think that they go on forever. Well, neoliberalism has that um, position uh, uh, as well. And I, I do actually, taking my cue from others, believe that um, as, as intellectuals and academics, we have to really, um, be very critical about the languages used um, and um, insist on um, a relationship between language and reality and language and truth, because without that, um, uh, there, there's no foundation of um, trust uh, amongst other things. But um, in terms of what I think, I, I, I do think that, um, the one possibly promising way forward, and it's why I ended the book where I did around introducing ecological questions is, is that I think that, that being able to address these things through a, a Green New Deal is timely to, to address the 
the problems with neoliberalism to to take up all the the questions of um, uh, treating um, things that are public services as publicly owned and not privatized as in terms of taxing all the top uh, the tax dodgers and finding all the um, people who um, are kind of uh, ruining the environment and so on and so forth. I think that this this is is one helpful way forward. And I'm not so sure what, what is happening in Tunisia about that. I stand to learn from that. I need to, I'm a bit out of touch, especially with the pandemic. I haven't been able to travel and I feel that I'm desperately out of touch when I can't travel and actually speak to people. Um, but I, but in, in Lebanon, it's interesting that, that um, there are many who said that the um, uprisings there have been definitely linked to uh, the whole kind of ecological movement in Lebanon. I was very interested in that, you know, the, the uprisings that began in Tripoli. Um, there'd been for months and months beforehand, there had been a lot of ecological demonstrations that then fed into the, the demonstrations against political corruption. But I'd be very interested to hear more about the, the Tunisian situation. Um, I stand to catch up. Yeah. And we have a question from Sara who says, Dear Professor, thank you very much for this amazing presentation of your book. I am also working on creative activism and in particular in gender activism throughout creative practices in the Maghrebi public space after 2011. I am interested in knowing your opinion about the idea of scholars that the aesthetic performance, okay, I'm, I'm little, I'm interested in knowing what you think about scholars who maybe argue that the aesthetic performance is a fallback without a significant political impact, like a demonstration of failure. I don't agree with these scholars and think that creative activism can, impact and change mentality. So maybe it could produce a political and social impact in the middle to long run. Thank you for your attention. I think that's, that's, that's very interesting. And um, I kind of feel that, yeah, I mean, that um, what, what is really striking about the um, Tunisian and Egyptian um, revolutions in particular, is that their language was art. I mean, that's what it, it really was. There, it, it wasn't um, so much um, long political analyses or, or speeches. It was overwhelmingly um, poetry, song, uh, you know, and we have to ask ourselves why. Um, and that's why I, I, I tried to answer the question through why the revolution was a poem, but in that respect, I did actually speak to people I was in touch with at the time, including Ahmed Haddad, the poet, and Adaf Suef. And I said, the Egyptian revolution feels to me just like a poem. I don't know why, but it just does. Does it feel that way to you? And they said, yes, yes, that's what it is. It's a poem. And so, you know, um, that that's a, a kind of very interesting question. Why is it a poem? Um, and um, I believe in some ways it occupied a, a kind of liminal space in that it, 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 it occurred, if you like, between um, a sense of the sacred on one side, you know, what goes by religion all that, and the political on the other. It was sort of between these two. And while these two things kept being conflated, you know, I was talking about neoliberal capitalism spiritualizing itself, and it, it, it treats the market as if it were God and they've been analyses like that, you know, this whole self-spiritualizing of neoliberalism, it collapses the political and the religious. And then on the other hand, with a certain kind of Islamism that commodifies Islam, there's also this sort of collapsing. And I thought that was kind of interesting about how art is functioning, is that it, it, it opens up a space between these things that allows for a, a kind of dialogue where um, not everything is all on one side, <laughs> um, as it were. So um, this question also exercised me a lot around the question of, of martyrs, because there were those who were trying to decide the value of martyr art about um, 
if your politics are correct, you can be considered a martyr, but if your politics are not correct, you're not considered a martyr. And I, I found that that politicization of martyrdom problematic, um, you know, partly because I, I have been reading about um, the accounts of um, British and uh, American soldiers who um, uh, got very traumatized by their role in the Iraq war and um, I, I uh, and lost friends and who to them were, were martyrs. And in a certain sense, they began to sort of reevaluate what they were doing. And in a certain sense, they felt that they had been exploited and misled. And um, so, in a way, when I speak about the question of the martyrs, also those whose lives should not be sacrificed, um, in a way, they were being expected to sacrifice their lives. And then they were asking, but for what? <laughs> for what political agenda? And interestingly, I see Elias Khoury really, it's a very brave thing to do because it's such a kind of controversial question to raise. Um, what does it mean to simply glorify martyrdom in the name of politics? Um, uh, you know, that there, there are other questions to, to be asked around this question of the politicization of everything. I find myself sort of, because in the past I have um, fallen very, you know, it's easy to just fall into the political discourse as, as a thing you should do. But I was finding myself holding back from that and wondering what is it that makes us think that um, politics is the highest good, <laughs> that, that if you're politically correct, you're in the, the space of the highest good. Um, and so I, I, I kind of think that um, it, it's also important not to politicize everything um, in terms of what revolution was saying. It's also about a human revolution, um, a humanizing revolution. Yeah, we have a few more questions. So, um... Judith was asking if you could say more about um, uh, about your definition of the left and how creative radicalism, how it relates to the wide variety of um, so-called leftisms in the Arab world, from third worldism to state socialism and from communism to liberal pro-democracy movements. So I think, um, yeah, if, could you answer? her question just it's not it's not dissimilar to to the one i asked you but yeah um yeah it's interesting that when um i started using the term the arab left someone said to me but there's no such thing <laughs> um and i thought well, why and the, the the question that sort of came up is that it, it it's it's so it has no political force in um, Arab countries. Um, but um, I, I find it hard to sort of conceive of the uprisings without a, a notion of, of an Arab left. And um, I think that um, for me, the one thing is that the important thing about it is um, not to fall into a sectarian politics and um, identity politics. Um, but to be concerned with questions of social justice. Of course, these um, <clears throat> are up for dialogue and debate um, all the time, but the emphasis should be on, on social justice. Um, and obviously, you know, discussions around it, uh, what it constitutes and so on. Um, and um, I, I also think that, yeah, I mean, it, it was also pointed out that the left um, is necessarily sort of international. And I do actually think that, that um, being able to support each other's struggles is, is important here too. Um, because I think that, that the left um, is involved in, in trying to articulate a universality wider than um, uh, the left as defined by capitalism, for example. So, so what is that wider universality? I was, I always um, am interested in Fanon, Franz Fanon, in that way because he talks about this wider universality. And um, 
I've seen Saeed give lectures twice. And the first time I saw Edward Said give a lecture was actually at my university um, in the 1990s. And his lecture was on, he was actually um, affiliated to the post-colonial center there for a few months. And he gave a lecture on this question of the wider universality. Um, and so I would say the, 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 the left concerns trying to fight for this wider universality and including to try and de define it and understand it. Thank you for that. We also have, we have a couple of questions in um, the Q&A, but also one that came in from Facebook. So, um, Regarding fundamentalism, I always think there should be a clear distinction made between practical Islam and theoretical Islam, considering that fundamentalism in practical Islam is used as a means to hold grounds, i.e. reproducing and controlling material things, material people, etc. Wouldn't you say fundamentalism is a form of capitalism par excellence? That's a question via Facebook. Well, I, I would say that sounds intriguing. I would love to <laughs> actually meet you and, and talk to you about this um, because um, there, there is a form of, there is a kind of capitalism in that. Um, and I also think that it's, it's interesting to look at um, the ways in which um, these things are mobilized. Um, uh, I'm currently trying to undertake long distance work based in Tripoli, Lebanon, and um, um, looking at jihadist groups who use um, jihadist discourse in surprising ways. They will sometimes use it completely strategically. Um, they will switch between Marxist discourses and jihadist ones. And what's interesting is that there's a lot of strategy sometimes on the ground around how these things um, are used. Um, and on, on a theoretical level, I was reading quite a lot of Qutub because I was really interested in his, his views. Um, and um, and I, I found that there was a lot that really interested me in them and that there were lots of sort of parallels where he was trying to sort of engage with Western philosophical tra traditions and make distinctions that I found intellectually interesting that we've kind of lost sight of um, in the way that his his questions and thoughts have been under overtaken by fundamentalist agendas. And so um, it's it's a hugely complex and varied field more than we perhaps, you know, pay attention to, or at least I, I do. Okay, and um, someone called Hanin has a couple of questions, so maybe I'll, I'll merge them. Um, she asks, do you think that after 10 years of Arab revolutions, would you say there is a new revolutionary literature or new aesthetic novel that can capture the spirit and complexity of revolutions? And then she also asks, do you think Arab revolutions are continuations of post-colonial struggle, but in a neoliberal context? Yeah, um, well, you know, this, yes, I do actually think that, that, that they are a continuation of those liberation movements. I think they're ongoing. And I think that the interesting thing about this is that um, these liberation movements are quite often defeated, but then they pop up elsewhere. But I see them as part of the, the same thing. So, you know, it gets defeated in one place and it pops up somewhere else. And I always feel that, that we should support it where it, it, it resurfaces. It's a bit like Rosa Luxemburg said that revolution is like a kind of underground river. And this underground river, it, you know, it doesn't go away. Um, so it might be dammed in one place and then underground it will find its way and, and pop up somewhere else. So, yeah, I, I mean, I do actually think so. And I do actually think that the, the context in, in, in which these liberation struggles are having to operate is, is in a struggle against neoliberalism. And I kind of think that um, there's a kind of panic <laughs> around the fact that, that neoliberalism is seen not to be working and a desperation to keep it going. Um, so 
in some senses, I feel that because there is that perception that that um, that things are not necessarily as bleak as they they seem. Um, yeah, and um, in terms of the aesthetic side of things, um, yeah, there's sometimes an attempt to say, ask the question, is there a post-colonial aesthetic? And for me, it has been this question of a poetics of the real. Um, and so I'm kind of very interested to, to, to keep reading um, what, what um, is being produced in, in the wake of the uprisings around this question. But of course, I could be surprised by other new developments. And um, I mean, various forms of satirical writing have come to the fore as well as um, dystopian fictions and so forth. But the one that really interests me is this question of a poetics of the real, <laughs> um, which is not the same as social realism. It's not um, that you're creating a model of society. It, the poetics of the real, for me, is this thing of when, when writers are writing for the sake of certain communities where they're trying to point the way <laughs> forward. Um, there's one more question. Um, in Algeria of Hirak, Algerian, which uh, is described as an Algerian nonviolent social movement, a real revolution since 2019, the military regime is accusing many opponents of Islamism. And when they say they are not, the regime says it is taqiyya. What do you think about this? Is that something that you, you um, know about? Well, I, I don't know too much about it. I would like to know, again, what's happening in a, in a contemporary sense. I'm a bit kind of starved for sources, actually. Um, and, but but there, there's a constant sort of, um, actually sort of mimicry of the way in which um, the neoliberal West keeps playing things off the, you know, Islamist threat, the terrorist threat, the extremist threat. And, and it's it's been, globalize this question of that, that, that you always have to defend yourself against this persistent threat. Um, and um, it's used as, as an excuse um, that is that, that I think that has to be challenged. Um, yeah. Well, thank you very much. It's, um, it's been wonderful hearing from you. I think that all the questions have been answered and um, it's just about seven o'clock. <laughs> um, well, thanks. Thank you very much. Oh. Thank, thanks for those really um, interesting questions. Um, yeah, I mean, if, if any of you are writing things, oh, please do get in touch. I'd like to, to read what you're writing. Very generous of you. Okay, well, thank you, everyone. I guess I'll I'll wrap it up here.